Hi everyone, welcome to uh, this Dodds webinar on building the civil service of the future. I can see that we're getting a lot of people actually dialing in as I'm as I'm speaking. So um, I hope you're all able to kind of access the link and, and get in as quickly as you want. Um, it's, it's great to have you all on this call, even though I can't see any of you. Um, so I hope you're having a good morning. My name's Tina Seth. I work for Dodds, um, mostly on the UK training side of the business, but I was a civil servant for about 12 years um, in various HR and LND roles, um, as well as uh, dabbling in policy and operational roles as well. And on the panel, we have today uh, Rupert McNeil, who's the government's chief people officer, um, Bernadette Thompson, who works at MHCLG and is head of wellbeing, inclusion and employee engagement, and Richard Hilsden, who sort of travels the country for us, running various events and conferences linked to diversity and inclusion. Um, and uh, introducing success, success profiles and helping people sort of understand how to use success profiles. So those, um, those are our panelists. And um, the, the theme today, which there has been a lot of interest in when we advertise this, this webinar, um, and I, I thought that is probably because of all the kind of interest in the civil service workforce of the future. There's a bit of a spotlight on this topic We've heard Michael Gove speak about the need to diversify, that the pool from which we're selecting people, the need for different skills, specialist skills. Uh, we've heard a bit from number 10 and Dominic Cummings about how, how he feels about the right people who should be in, in government. So it's a very, very topical issue. Um, and, and Dodds is very much involved in supporting that vision and being a part of that discussion through our diversity and inclusion events. We're helping people's careers through unlocking the civil service and women into leadership, BAME into leadership, and through um, kind of really thinking about what success profiles means for different, different audiences, candidates and recruiters. So we are got our ear to the ground in terms of what, what civil servants are thinking about the future. So the way the webinar is going to run is that I will ask each of our panelists to give their thoughts um, in terms of what is planned for the civil service in the future and, and how, how they see it coming, coming to fruition and what the benefits will be. And while they're talking, um, please put any questions, any challenges, any thoughts, experiences in the chat box, because then I will then sort of pick those up and, and use those to run a discussion between the panel and, and yourself. So we want lots of questions and, lo and lots of thoughts as people are talking. Um, so without further ado, um, I think we'll start with Rupert actually. Um, if you could give your give your thoughts on, on what yeah. sort of what what your thoughts are on the on the civil service of the yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, well thanks Tina and, and uh, th thanks everyone. Really delighted to uh, to be here. Well this is um, the, the title of this uh, session is uh, is basically uh, what my job is. Uh, which is uh, to make sure that we've got the capability we need now um, and uh, but also looking ahead actually in quite a long uh, time frame you know what will we need you know, at the moment we're very preoccupied in the civil service in, in all parts and elsewhere in the public sector with uh, EU transition responding to Covid but also there's a lot of other stuff to do building back better leveling up everything else so um, we, we need to think about making sure we've got the skills for all of that and then also uh, looking further ahead, you know, we think about um, submarines and aircraft carriers operating for uh, many decades. Um, and actually, we are, I think, thinking about the workforce and the capability of the civil service in the same way. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about tomorrow, resorting tomorrow for the 31st of December, for next summer. But I'm also worried about the uh, leaders that we, uh, you know, will we have the leaders and the skills that we need? in uh 2040 2050 2080 so um because some of the people who are joining now as apprentices and uh as fast streamers and others are going to be leading the civil service in the 2040s and 20 and 2050s so that's a, a really um really important part of, uh, of the role of course all of that has got to work in um a common and collaborative culture and really the reform 
agenda that uh, Michael Gove laid out at Ditchley. It's going to be in a command uh, paper coming out um, uh, in the coming uh, in the coming weeks. Um, we'll sort of lay, lay, lay out what we mean by that vision on reform and on um, capability being a very uh, important part of that. So um, what does a workforce for the future look like? Well, I think the, the, the one thing I can say definitively about the workforce for the future is uh, it's got to be a workforce which is expert. I think that's the thing which is really it's expert in its capability. And I think one of the things which I'm very intrigued about and very pleased about with COVID is that I think people are getting a much broader concept of what expertise is. Expertise is the person in the care home, the sister on the ward, the person in the job centre running universal credit, as much as it is the lawyer or the scientist or whatever. And everybody has expertise. That's really important to bear in mind. We come back to uh, success profiles and people can evolve and change their expertise over our um, hundred year lives uh, and our careers. And that's also a really important point. And, and the, the workforce of the future is in a very symbiotic relationship between the employer and the employee um, about, you know, part of the deal is you give me the opportunity to learn and accred accredit myself and increase my value. Um, and at the same time, uh, the, um, at the same time, you know, I give back and I know that I have to keep myself trained up. So one of the things that uh, I think we'll see more of, as we see in other organisations, professional services firms particularly, is continuous professional development. It's not something that you do voluntarily. It's because you just, you know, we all need to know how the world is going to change after the 31st December because of leaving EU exit. It'll have an impact on all our jobs. We all, we all need to learn how to respond to things like COVID. We all need to make sure that we're using the latest standards in our profession and that we are acting um, in the most, uh, and that we're, we're, we're fully up to date. Now, the other thing, uh, so as well as expertise and a broad definition of what expertise is, um, and that people will accumulate different forms of it over their careers, we're also moving into this really exciting world of automation in all its forms. Things that take, uh, as we have tended to say, take the, the robot out of the human by taking tasks which are uh, tedious, repetitive, freeing people up to do interesting things. And we've seen that, for example, if I take the example of job centres, universal credit, uh, you know, the work coaches there are enabled and able to do many more interesting things with their clients uh, because uh, they can um, they they can spend that time uh, because they have time free by from automation. Similarly, um, in a prison, people might have heard me talk about this before, but you know, the, the 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 prison officer who does not have to take take the food order is has more time they can spend and doing the, the paperwork, more time they can spend doing what they're meant to be doing, which is involved in rehabilitation, supporting prisoners. So, so that's uh, just, just a couple of, of, of practical examples. So, um, uh, and the strengths and gaps in leaders are basically, you need leaders who build the expertise of their teams, who build the capability of their teams. That is a fundamental, and, and makes it a good place to work. That's the fundamental thing. That's actually quite a high skilled job in itself. Um, we don't want leaders who do the jobs that their team members do. That's not what this is about. It's about brigading the systems that they're running and their parts of the systems that they're running um, and um, making that uh, making that effective. And I believe that the only thing that a leader does that's different from experts in their team, actually, is they have the, the luxury, the requirement to look longer term, see things from, from the hill they're standing on that people who are doing the work can't see at the moment because they're busy doing the work and make sure they're creating the environment in which the people doing the work can be as successful as possible for this job and for the next task they're being given. Now, success profiles are a really hugely important part of this, and uh, it's so great that we're talking about that today because uh, they do several things. First of all, they require people in their system, the hiring manager and the people running the system, to think really carefully about um, what they actually need, what skills they actually need in their in their organisation. What are the activities that people need to perform in their jobs? Um, and there's, a, there's an interesting question about the maturity of thinking about jobs, because um, the, the unskilled manager says, I want person X in that job. The more skilled manager says, I want a person like person X in that job. Um, the truly skilled manager says, I have these sets of activities that need to be done. How do I configure them into jobs, which are um, going to be filled by the best possible person? And that's what we're trying to get to. Now, um, the uh, the way in which we're um, we're looking at success profiles and that it, it's actually they should be making it easier for people to be promoted who have the right capability and skills 
um, they should make it easier for us to be very precise about the essential criteria of a job. And uh, as we get used to success profiles and thinking about them, um, there's got to be, you know, all of us on this call need to be looking at job descriptions at success profiles and saying, actually, is that really an essential criterion or am I ruling out a whole load of great people? Take an example. Does a job really require uh, a degree? No, most jobs don't. In fact, probably every job doesn't, as long as a person's got the experience that is associated with it. The degree is a proxy for um, saying that someone's got a particular skill set. So being precise about the about the criteria becomes very uh, becomes very important, and not over specifying, but also setting quite a high bar um, in terms of behaviour strengths and technical uh, technical expertise. Some people might know I did a um, I. I uh, decided that I wanted to be an accountant after 30 years and uh, I, I've just qualified. Um, and uh, that's good. There are jobs that I could do now that I couldn't have done without that qualification. So, uh, you know, thinking about that and looking at the market around that is very, uh, is very important. Uh, and that's really the, the final point, which is all of this is a system. Everyone needs to be thinking about what skills do are actually needed for the activity that they are accountable for, whether it's them as an individual contributor or whether it's um, uh, across the team that they're running or the department they're running or um, uh, great role models for this. Uh, my boss Alex Chisholm thinks about that for his system uh, and Simon Case for, for his system. So at every level and ultimately up to the Prime Minister. So I think it's quite, I think it's a, that's, a, that's the, the essence of this. What skills do you need now, tomorrow and in two, three, four, ten, twenty years? Um, and the more senior you are in the organisation, the longer you should really be thinking about that uh, about that time frame. And how will you get them in the best uh, best possible way, and access um, the, uh, the the broadest range of um, of skills and, uh, uh, and and capabilities. So it's a very exciting time, actually, for all of us. I think you know none of us are going to find that our jobs uh, are untouched by automation. Everyone should be thinking about what automation means for their job. Um, I actually predict, uh, my, my, my view is that um, by 2050, uh, there'll probably be more, um, more nurses and um, frontline service workers who will be more skilled and more technologically enabled. And some things that we've taken for granted, professional uh, areas, uh, may um, may actually not exist anymore because they've been automated, including expert areas. So, um, and I think it's very hard to think about, uh, you know, my role is, you know, I'm head of the HR function and HR profession. Do I actually think in 20 years time there will be such a thing as the HR profession? Well, I can't really think that the fact that we're going to need to integrate technology and uh, people and systems means that maybe the profession could look really very different and it'd be hard to draw the distinction between technology and HR and um, and data, for example. So re re really interesting time, Tina. <laughs> okay. Right, thanks. Thanks, Rupert. Yes, yes, it is. Um, and um, I definitely get the different emphasis on the ex expertise that we want to bring into the civil service. Um, sort of moving away from the traditional skills that were, that were valued before. So it'd be interesting to see how that actually becomes a reality and we actually see those different different people coming in. Um, I'm not seeing any questions on the chat box. I mean, um, can people start sort of even just saying hi, hello, so we can check that it's working? Um, just, just say hello, say you're there. We've got 322 people um, on the call, so you must... Um, Hopefully, have some have some have some thoughts from from what you've just heard from Rupert and some opinions. So please do put them in the chat, um, even if it's to say hi. I'm whoever from wherever. It'd be it's just good to know that you're um, yeah. all there. Actually, um, I have one thing. Is that right? Which is just yeah, to say, honestly, as we're talking about things, success profiles, capability building. Um, I hope that everybody on this call feels that they collectively own this system. So any uh, any ways in which it can be improved, we're always really up for, and um, and and people feeling that they 
yeah, they've got a real stake in it. So I, I just want to make that point. So so really, any any feedback is um, is welcome, including yeah. do this thing completely. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's it's very much a, a two way a two way discussion. Um, we all want to hear hear from you as well because that kind of informs the way forward as well. So let, let's uh, let's move on to Bernadette. Bernadette, what what are your thoughts on this? To my reflection, I'm not going to be as futuristic as as Rupert thinking about 2050. Gosh, where would I be then? Um, but you know, as I was reflecting on this, I, I do love you know. Um, some uh, acronyms or letters to, 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 to make me remember stuff. So I, the acronym that I kind of came up with is kind of PPI, uh, and my daughter had a bit of a giggle when I was talking to her about this. Um, so people, preparation and inclusion. I'm an inclusion person, so I'm gonna have to talk about inclusion. So thinking about um, the people perspective, and I think as we know, people are the most important asset in an organization. So when we're thinking about the future of work, people, our employees need to be at the heart of anything uh, that we do. So as uh, Rupert was rightly saying, in the future, we know that some of our processes already are being um, automated and more so um, will be working alongside uh, robots. I was speaking to a friend of mine who works in Amazon and they were telling me about the fantastic robotics that you know make their work um, a bit easier but we know that people are here to stay and people the role of people will change but people will be part of um, the workforce more broadly so you know thinking at a time like this when in an unprecedented time there's no blueprint none of us had a blueprint before covid so i think you know for many organizations we had to respond at pace we had to redesign the way we work very quickly and you know a lot of really quick cultural changes needed to come into our organization and we weren't planning for this at this point but i think we need to remember that um, when we think about our people our line managers are at the heart of this and this new hybrid way of working which will be in our short-term future uh, we don't know how long and thinking about that that our estates will probably uh, reduce as uh, the hybrid way of working becomes uh, more part of our organization. So what we need to do is to ensure that our line managers are equipped to motivate, to empower, to inspire, and ensure that our workforce is productive during this kind of transition. And I think really organizations and within the civil service were really, you know, within my department, we're, we're quite good at this, but thinking about the productivity aspect rather than the presence. So, you know, I know some, some uh, you know, operational areas, you know, found it um, quite hard um, to think about someone, you know, working for them being remote, but it's happened. And, you know, we've had to deal with that quite quickly, but making sure that as, as we progress on this journey, not knowing what the next 12 or 18 months could look like with the virus, really thinking about how we uh, uh, um, equip our line managers to manage remotely and get the best um, out of our organization. And I think um, the other aspect, of my, you know, thinking about my reflections on people is around well-being. And I think we're putting a lot of emphasis now, and rightly so, and organizations must invest in the well-being of their people. Um, you know, this isn't just, you know, you're doing a tough job. It might be tough at work, but it's tough at home too. All of us, I dare say, have been affected one way or the other by this pandemic. So putting well-being at the heart of what we do and making sure we have a robust offers, um, a robust package of well-being for our employees is key. And, you know, we're, we're, we're doing quite well with that within the civil service. Um, but thinking about an inclusive approach to well-being and just making sure that, you know, uh, people's circumstance, you know, it's not one hat fits all. We really think about what offer um, our employees need to keep well physically not just mentally well but also physically well thinking about you know home is work and work is home and you sit at your desk at eight o'clock and you know if you know thinking about myself i would need to scurry around different departments usually um but now I, i'm quite sedentary um at, at, at my workstation so really thinking in an organization of how you can keep your people safe as well as we progress into that somewhat i dare say unknown future so going to the next p which is around preparation and i was 
looking at some articles, so looking at Deloitte, looking at PwC and EY, and they've got some fantastic papers about the future of work. However, a lot of these were written before COVID, so some of the content might need to change slightly. <clears throat> so thinking about how we prepare um, with COVID now in sight, and Rupert has touched on this uh, really brilliantly, thinking about the capabilities. So in my department, so we're thinking about the new roles that didn't exist um, prior to COVID-19. Um, thinking in my directorate, we had to quickly stand up shielding and you know we were the department that made sure those boxes um, got delivered. So these roles didn't exist before COVID, but we really had to quite quickly build people's capabilities and set up a whole unit to deal with that. And think about the existing roles um, that we have now, but thinking about as we are yeah. entering or have entered already in the second wave, how some of those roles need to be changed. And Rupert mentioned this as well, um, upskilling people's digital capability. And you know, I was speaking to someone in our age network, um, our 50 plus network the other day, and I said, who said 50 plus people can't be techie? I dare say, you know, so it's really making sure that everyone across our organization is upskilled and can make good use of the digital uh, tools that we need. We definitely need to um, connect and collaborate across the organizations. Um, you know, it's fantastic that we you know we're all virtual now. We, we wouldn't have thought that we could have done that. And at a time where our colleagues in Newcastle, in the West Midlands, you know, we can all be on what platform without having to travel. So I think thinking about the future, um, corporate travel would definitely dwindle because look, we've been doing brilliantly, brilliant things uh, within the virtual space. And I think um, just at the back of one of Rupert's comments earlier on, um, the civil service was shaping the future. They're the document out there. So if you Google shaping the future civil service, read the document, comment on the document, you know, we want everyone to be involved in helping us um, to shape the future of the civil service. And my final reflection on inclusion, and I have to um, mention inclusion, but it is worth a listen or worth a read if you haven't uh, to Michael Goh's Ditchley speech. Um, so I pulled out and went in there, went to the parts that he uh, specifically mentioned on diversity and inclusion. So really bringing together all the elements of diversity and inclusion. Um, so thinking about, you know, we spend, we pay a lot of emphasis on the diversity of our people, so our workforce diversity, but thinking about the place um, in where we make those decisions and uh, the perspective and making sure that our policies are um, diverse and quoting from Michael Grove, he said, delivery on the ground, making a difference in the community. And that is how with our civil service, making sure our outputs land well within the communities that we serve. But also thinking about the hybrid way of working and making sure that we are inclusive in our cultures. So regardless of where people are working, making sure that message of inclusion gets through the people who are working, you know, who have to uh, go into work. So our fantastic colleagues in DWP, I'll call them out, who have to go into a job centre, but making sure that we're bringing them along, albeit there might be colleagues in DWP who are also working at home. So thinking about that and in MHCLG, we have just crafted our hybrid working charter and I'm going to give Katie Hart try to call out because it's an absolute brilliant uh, charter that we're working toward. Data um, should demonstrate our progress with diversity. And also, you know, touching on the words of Michael Goat, he said practical, measurable improvements in the lives of others should matter more. So it's the outputs, using our data more intelligently to drive progress and um, make um, help us make better decisions. And finally, and I think Richard is going to talk a, a, a lot about this when he touches on success profiles, but looking at the employee life cycle, whether it's recruitment, whether it's talent management, whether it's um, uh, uh, employee engagement, just making sure that uh, inclusion, we bring um, everyone in. Um, and again, touching on something uh, Michael Gove uh, said in his speech, to we need to diversify for the talent pool from which we draw. So really thinking about how we can bring people on within organizations during this time, using the tools that we have um, 
but also um, not forgetting um, the place where we operate from. And again, um, you know, you can see that I've, read, I've listened to Michael Coe's speech really well, but <laughs> diversify the presence of uh, a government across um, the UK. So, and I do love this, I, you know, I think if anything, positive has come out of COVID. It is the fact that our colleagues in Newcastle, our colleagues up there in uh, Birmingham, our colleagues across the UK can actually participate in some of the events that have been ongoing and would have, if, when, if we were not in this situation, would have just been maybe held in Whitehall. So, um, you know, we have become more inclusive by default um, in our approach to um, uh, getting colleagues to attend. So those, those are my three reflections. Uh, PPI, uh, people, preparation, and inclusion. <laughs> Bernadette, thank you. Thank you. Some really wide ranging points there. And, um, you know, just focusing on the fact that, that well-being is, um, is just as important and good leadership managing remotely as much as the, the, the other skills that we need in the civil service. So um, very important not to forget that angle. Um, Richard, you've been waiting patiently, so um, right. <laughs> let's hear let's hear your thoughts. Okay, thank you very much. Well, welcome everyone. Um, my role is rather different, I think, in some respects, because uh, both uh, uh, Rupert and Bernadette have reminded us of, of where where we perhaps need to go, and you know, Michael Gove has set out something of that thinking, and and uh, uh, Rupert's talked about. Uh, thinking carefully about criteria and so on. And I think that's where I'll be coming from. And I think uh, 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 Bernadette's talked about, uh, the, used the word people a lot. I think that was part of the problem that, you know, all our competences and all the rest of it, hardly people hardly figured in the conversation really. And uh, success profiles have, have, uh, have reminded us of that in the way it's introduced strengths. I, my job is really to, to talk about, because I've been traveling the country, as Tina said, and, and running training events and, and working with people who are introducing this new approach to uh, recruitment and some reflections on it. I can take a reflection from absolutely from yesterday. I was working in a government department which remained nameless and someone who's very experienced, been working with success profiles for the last two years said, and my heart sank when he said, well, nothing has really changed. We've just rebadged a few things. And, you know, I think what I wanted to get across was that in order to deliver the workforce of the future, we're going to have to stop just explaining success profiles as though it's just a rebadging exercise. And I don't think we do. And I certainly don't. We've got to get people to use it and understand what it really is, because it is actually very different. And I don't think people quite understand that. And let me kind of illustrate it. Um, uh, I mean, first of all, to say success, the change of success profiles was very popular. I, I know this from I've heard it from thousands of people. It's it was a good change. Competencies have got tired and formulaic and people's card discs were groaning with examples they concocted for various competence uh, uh, applications and so on. And so uh, and in that sense, but it did bring with it some anxieties. Anxieties are having to write a, uh, a personal statement from, from a blank screen, as it were, or from essential criteria. Um, uh, it, it, you know, it did introduce some anxieties of, of pre presentations might now be part of the assessment process and so on. But Success Profiles has been comprehensive, flexible. It offers a flexible, innovative tools for vacancy holders to really get to grips with this. So how has it actually gone down? I don't want this to sound negative because I'm a great supporter of, of success profiles if it's done properly. Uh, just a few things. This idea of translation from the past, I see it all the time. Vacancy holders, when I say to them, well, what have you done to the job description? Nothing. They've taken the job description and just turned it into behaviours. Um, um, so that's not really been happening on a scale as I would like to see. Too much translation going around. Um, uh, defining the job in terms of actually have we um, gone to first principles in terms of what the job is about. And I think that's what you were talking about, Anna and Rupert. We have to get back to what is this job all about? What do we want people to do? Um, then there is uh, still getting in the way i think a lot of the perceived in, in, unfairnesses that we've inherited because success profiles didn't really it hasn't wasn't designed to address as it's such consistency and and so on um so sifting which is the biggest complaint i think people 
lack of feedback and, uh, and perhaps to some extent uh, uh, sifters who aren't perhaps not as trained as, as well as they should be. I also want to finger adverts as well. One of the things that, that is very clear, I have in my, in my uh, uh, computer a, a, an advert from earlier this year which is still using the word competencies. Now we've got to stop doing that. Um, and, uh, uh, and adverts are often civil service are a long, bureaucratic, boring, they're meant to attract. We've got to attract uh, diverse uh, groups of people here. Uh, and so I think adverts is something we need to, they're dull and unattractive. Diversity is not on the map as much as it should be. One of my favorite questions when I have a group of, uh, of vacancy holders is, what what would diversity look like in terms of this role you're going for? How would you represent it in the advert? And I get lots of blank looks. Now, I think to some extent it's easy to point the finger at vacancy holders and the SCS people who sit above them, perhaps. But actually, I've got a question I've written down here. Why would they be able to surprise themselves? <laughs> You know, we've got to think of what is diversity. Diversity is recognised often when it actually turns up and, and you think, well, good heavens. And I think we need the candidate to help out in this context and where strengths come in and the way we use strengths. At the moment we use strengths, we, they're pulled like a rabbit out of a hat at the uh, interview stage. But now we're going to have a psychometric version. We've got the opportunity perhaps to invite uh, candidates to talk about their strengths in the personal state. We need more guidance on personal statements too, because I think a lot of civil servants have been quite confused about how to how to do that. We've got unconscious bias now going beyond the protected characteristics, which I think the civil service has done a very good job on unconscious bias in that respect. But selecting in our own image, you know, it's very interesting to sit there in a room as I have done with a bunch of people who shall remain nameless to the department who said to me, you know that uh, matrix that's the end of the, of the behaviours booklet that lists the strengths that sort of go with the behaviours. We can only use those behaviours. In other words, they're imprisoning themselves with a view of strengths as though it's just another straitjacket like competencies. And that's a kind of thought process we need to get out away from. Um, but then there's the new ideas, I think, that are around. I mean, I've had some interesting conversations with vacancy holders about the use of work sampling, well known in the empirical world of, of HR as one of the best predictors of future job performance. Work sampling, rather than sitting there and making a judgment whether you like the cup of this person's jib. Um, uh, but, and that's perhaps one of the things that remains very unexplored, expensive perhaps, and sometimes time consuming. We've got to think about assessment and scoring perhaps moving more to some parallel assessment scoring of each candidate against each question rather than just perhaps sequentially with candidates. And, and finally, I think a training refresh. Um, I know that uh, uh, Rupert said this before that, I mean, I would say that because I'm involved in training, but really we've got to stop explaining uh, uh, um, SP uh, and actually get people to understand what it really is. It's a tool which starts right from the very word go, from the moment we think about we've got a gleam in our eye about how we want to deliver success in this, this area or not. But at the moment what's happening, and it's interesting that the current training course, one of the current training course, starts from the point of view of deciding on behaviours, not on deciding what job success should look like, what those outcomes should look like. So we've got to rethink our training in this area. Well, I hope I've laid a trail of, of some of the things, without being too negative, uh, of some of the things I've seen and some of the things that we're going to need to address in order to deliver these workforce uh, future aspirations that we might have. Okay. Okay. Great, thank you all very much for, for that, coming in from very very different perspectives, but saying some very very similar things as well. We have got lots, hundreds of questions, I just wasn't seeing them before, but um, I can see them all now. Um, people have said, great start, um, so we're getting a, a lot of kind of um, interest in what you're saying. So um, the first question that maybe I'll pose to you is um, uh, something based around Lord Agnew's recent comments on... I'll just find it again. Um, Lord Agnew's uh, recent comments on government's overuse of consultants. Um, what's the panel's view on whether capability should be built or bought? Should capability, what capability should be internal and what should be delivered in, in partnership? So 
I guess this goes back to kind of some of the points Michael Gove made at, at Ditchley about expanding the pool from where we're bringing people in. But I'd like to hear your thoughts. Rupert, yeah. would, you like to, would you like to come in on that one? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, so f first of all, let me say, say something about Lord Agnew. Uh, he's a, um, he's sort of, yeah, I'm sure we're all very fortunate the ministers we get. He's, he's the um, uh, one, one of two ministers who um, look after my agenda and are responsible for it, uh, Julia Lopez and Theodore Agnew. And um, they are so committed to capability building and so respectful of what civil servants do and civil service capability. And I was really pleased. Um, I didn't put it in the paper, but I thought it was fine that letter got in the paper because it was absolutely spot on. Um, the the one, one thing that I found coming into the public sector, I'm a relatively new civil servant, I'll be five years at Christmas in the civil service, is, uh, and I say to my friends outside, people I know there is, you've no idea how expert people are in the public sector and in government. And not only are they very expert, they have to be expert because they have very little money, very little time to do things, and all mistakes are visible. So, um, you know, th there is already a lot of expertise here. And, and frankly, there's a lot of stuff, particularly through this period of COVID and EU transition and other things where other organizations could look in at us and see um, what we're doing as absolutely uh, world leading across, across civil service in, in all its parts. So what is this about consultancy? Well, it's actually about, if you, if you dig down into it, it's saying the solution is not to go and necessarily buy in the service from someone else. Now think about the economics of that. When you use a consultancy, and sometimes it is absolutely the right solution because you don't have the, cap the capacity or you don't have the skill yet to do what you need to do. But the moment you're bringing in um, a a, someone from a consultancy, you're paying a margin that you wouldn't necessarily pay if you're hiring a person into that role or even if you're using contingent labor. And, and also um, using external expertise like that is like uh, chewing gum. It has no nutritional value. So you don't keep those skills in the organization after you've, uh, after you've used them. So um, what we're talking about here with um, the, the move away from, um, you know, making sure people use consultancies in a smart way, and we spend a lot of money on it, a billion plus on consultants. Some things we couldn't have done without it, but you know, we do that, is to, is to say, Really, you should only, in a department or in a team, you should only spend on external advice once because it's your responsibility as a professional to basically take that expertise and transfer it into the system so you don't need to buy that skill in again. That's, that's the simplest way of looking at it. And, and that creates another incentive to build the, sk the, the skills and capability of teams. And that's linked to the other point about uh, that we're very keen to do, which is to make sure that people feel that they can move in and out of the public sector and in and out of the civil service much more easily. And uh, one of the things that I'm very committed to is making it clear that actually the outside world could do, you know, there is huge capability within the civil service and people could go out and, and come back in. Don't forget, you can go back in and come, you can go out and come back in at the same grade within a uh, Five year, five year period under the commissioners, commission's rules. So we're going to do some interesting stuff on consulting and on uh, controlling. And it will, I think, force the system a bit to look more clearly at what capability they actually need. Sorry, long answer, Tina. I'll keep them shorter next time. No, that's great. That's great. I think there's been a lot of interest in, in that particular area, which is why I asked it. So, um, so that's fine. Um, there's, there's another question. I'm going to link two sort of themes together. Someone's asked about qualifications and um, technical qualifications, academic qualifications, etc., um, and, and feels that maybe are they're not um, required anymore because uh, Rupert, you've talked about expertise that people develop in their in their role. So, so what's your sort of take on qualifications? I think that links to success profiles as well. And another one linked to success profiles um, really is. Um, it's very strong on general capabilities, but in some roles, the technical skills are sometimes significantly more important than the success profile capability. Yeah. E.g. highly technical data analysts may not be able to demonstrate team playing and communication, but may be outstanding data scientists. Um, so how do we bridge the gap? Well, um, so I, I could go. Yeah, yeah do, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, and, and I, 
I'd like to sort of tee, tee up Richard on this because it's really the point that he made. Um, you know, when you're drafting a success profile, uh, you should start with what is the outcome? What is the activity? What's the outcome that's needed? How does this role contribute to performing that, delivering that outcome through the activity that's performed? And actually, in most cases, it will be the technical aspects of that role, which I think should be the first line in the success profile. Um, uh, and every role has a technical aspect, including roles that involve a lot of emotional intelligence and um, social skills. You know, those are technical skills as well. So, so I think that I think it's a very well made point. And we don't yet, unfortunately, and this is the capability we need to build. We're not good enough at specifying what the technical component is, and that's where professions become very important. And um, for example, in HR, we we've, we've been very clear. And do do go and have a look at it if you want to see what we think good success profiles look like in HR. Every director role in the HR profession, every deputy director role, and now and going down into the system um, has um, a success profile and is part of a career framework. So you can see what technical skills are actually um, are actually required, and that's been developed with people at all levels in the function thinking about that, and it will evolve. So I think it's a very good point. And then the other point is about accreditation. I mean, if I, um, I think that one of the great innovations in UK capability and education over the past sort of 20 years has been um, experiential assessment. So this is where uh, you might have to sit an exam or not, but your experience will be assessed sometimes through a work sample, as Richard alluded to, or uh, through an interview process. Um, and I'd really encourage everybody to try and look at their profession and see how they would. There is accreditation available. Go and ask for it and try and try and get it. And that's what we're doing in in HR with the CIPD. Um, similar uh, similar things exist elsewhere. And, and actually, just a, a a quick thing in terms of the practicalities of this. Um, when you want to think about what, you know, one thing to do is to start with drafting your own success profile. I've done that, and it's a really interesting exercise. How do you what do you contribute to the purpose and strategy of the organization that you're in and your activity? Can you express your job in um, you know, 200 words? Using the strength dictionary, using what you know about the technical requirements. And then look at the people in your team and say, who is the person I could least afford to lose? Because that's probably the person that you need to develop to go on and do their next role. And what would you draft their success profile? <laughs> And then start thinking about who in your team or who elsewhere in the system um, or which apprentice or whatever would be the person that could take that job. So, so I think to, to Richard's point, um, you know, this is a this is a participatory thing. You've got to get into it, get your hands into it and start working with it and and practicing with it. And um, underpinning all of that is that still after 30 years, interviewing and selecting people is the hardest, higher stakes thing that I do. It's really hard. And anyone who's going into a selection process of any kind, starting with the job profile to the other bit, who is coasting or thinking it's easy, is not doing it right. That's my view. It's a hard thing, and it's the most important thing you do for the organization. I don't know if Richard wants to add on the success well, profile. I just want to add a couple of things. As you've mentioned about uh, uh, people thinking about pro doing their own profile, and I think this is really important. You know, we've got two elements of the success profile system: experience and technical, and they very often go hand in hand. Just because I think it was the major project office once said, just because someone's got a a, a Prince two qualification in project management doesn't mean to say they can run a project. And we very often have to to ask, invite experience and examine it and score it as part of the process. Um, and, uh, you know, application forms are, again, an area, I've talked about adverts, that need to be developed. Uh, why can't we have application forms which actually aren't, invite people to put down uh, what they regard as their strengths and achievements? You know, some self-profiling uh, self of themselves. And people see these, I've recommended for a long time, that people have a summary of their career experience and achievements or behaviors and strengths if it, in modern language and um, that they are what they're offering the market but too often uh, we've been stuck on chronological cvs rather than what i would call behavior based cvs uh, and the other thing i'd say is that uh, i always thought it odd that amongst essential criteria we haven't considered the possibility of inviting people to have a uh, prioritize essential criteria 
we have often lead behaviours, but we haven't taken that process far enough so that if we've got a technical specialist, we want that to be there in highlights in the actual advert at the start. Okay. Bernadette, I wonder if you had any thoughts about this question on um, technical qualifications and um, how how they're assessed through success profiles or bringing in your own experience as well. So, so my, my, my thoughts on this, I think, you know, clearly there are roles that need to technical qualifications. Absolutely. And I think they, they should be part of the essential criteria. But I think it's, uh, I can't remember who mentioned it earlier on. Um, I think it was Rupert. Um, if the role does not require you to, you know, be a graduate, then why put it um, on, on, the, um, on the advert? So I think it's really taking time, not rushing. Uh, through your recruitment campaign. Yes, you want people in quickly, but you want the right people with the right skills um, to do the right job. So I think it's really taking time to craft um, that advert or that job description rather, making sure, you know, you've got that blend. If they does, you know, if you do need those technical skills and it is an absolute requirement for the role, then yes, it should be in as uh, part of the essential criteria if it's desirable then it should be indesirable but also um touching on richard richard's uh point not um being quite uh, what's the word straight jack having a straight jacket approach oh this is the only approach that will work you know we've used it mm -hmm. and we will continue to use it so really taking time to think about what's re what's required for the role and you know, having that blended approach, um, qualification as well as um, behaviours and strengths. Brilliant, great. Okay, thank you. So a lot of interest in, in success profile. So so let me stick to that uh, theme for, for now. Um, someone said, uh, I agree with Richard that success profiles has not been understood and implemented to realise the full benefits of it. So that's an interesting reflection back. Uh, this is because the colleagues who are inclined to, to rig the system towards putting in a candidate who they have preconceptions of who would fit in instead of someone who brings the skills and experience that would be better match the job and bring some DNI to the role. Um, now, rig the system is a, is a pretty kind of um, emotive thing to, to, put, to put in there, but sometimes this is the perception that people, people have about why diversity is not as wide as it should be in the civil service. So I'd be really interested to get your get your thoughts on that one. Maybe start, starting with Bernadette this time. So I think um, are all our processes 100% watertight, I would say no. So there is still some work to be done. Um, my, my point on this, however, is I would like, like to get to a point where, you know, people who have gone through a process can give us feedback um uh, so that we can understand better what uh, some of what this colleague has raised um yes we know within the system uh, uh, uh there are some issues where people feel that they have not had a fair crack um at a particular uh, particular role and it'd be interesting to get that feedback to actually understand better um what has gone on there but using my department um, as an example in mxclg we use a system um, which is totally blind. Um, the first time I used it, I, I couldn't believe um, how blind this system was. And, you know, you didn't have anyone's details. All you had was the narrative on the screen, which was mixed up, dependent on what behaviour you were looking at uh, throughout the range of the uh, 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 behaviours you were reading. So I think it's recognising that um, where things have not gone well, we have processes where people can actually um, give us that feedback so we can look at that campaign a bit closer. I know it's something that Rupert always says that, you know, if they have anything, let us know. But I think um, for recruiters, really thinking about best practice recruitment, the blind sifting, making sure you've got a, a diverse panel, re really getting back to the basics, thinking about the advert, think about the language in the advert, you know, who are you trying to attract? Making good use of employee network groups so you can get a diverse uh, range of applicants. I remember someone saying to me, well, why do we have to send them to employee networks? You know, behavioral insights uh, kind of tell us that um, if you um, package something in a different way, you'll get a different outcome. So just posting it on the internet where 
sometimes a lot of people don't look at it um but if you target um target the adverts through employee network groups a lot of people trust the employee network so they'll open um the um what do you call it the advert and actually look at it putting in a positive action statement if you, you you know you're looking for any underrepresented group so really making sure that that the process in itself is open uh to diversity and inclusion and just at this point someone sent me a text um just now about calling out the civil service careers website for people who are not civil servants so i might as well do it now before i forget so you know if you're listening to this and you're not a civil service and you want to be part of our brilliant civil service please go on our careers website and um, that will tell you a bit more about the civil service and you'll be able to view uh some of our jobs that are available so no those are my thoughts but really getting the basics right from the language to who you attract to how you attract and where you are posting those adverts and really making sure they're going out to diverse places but also giving us feedback on how stuff has gone that, that, yeah. there's some really practical tips that thank you very much for those so um i, I think it's worth staying on this for a couple, couple more minutes this, this concept yeah. of job, jobs jobs for the boys and um you know people having um certain candidates in mind that impacts impacts diversity so very quickly if, if um richard and rupert would, would also like to comment on how success profile should should help to overcome some of that i mean i i, I would like to if i may just pick up something that uh, rupert said you know how you know the talent and, and cleverness that we have within the civil service also applies to how well they are at gaming a system you know uh, the so you know i i, I rig is a strong word but but I think civil servants always try to find a, you know, a way through the thing. And uh, uh, but the problem, I think, you know, may be the fact that we've still got a nervousness about opening up the other side of the table, the applicant side of the table. I, I know this because one of the most frequent things I hear people say is the whole question of personal statements is crowd, cla you know, clouded in some mystery. You know, the guidance is a bit unclear. What people say to me, why can't I put my strengths in there? Why am I asked only to address three or four behaviours or six essential criteria? You know, we, the, the, the way through this conundrum, I think, is to be able to open up the other side of the table by allowing the candidates to tell us who they are and what their take is on, on the job and what they can offer. And, and that would include their, their strengths and so on. At the moment, we've still got the politics of ownership on the, other, on the selector side of the table, pre-prescribed behaviors we've still got we've got the um, strengths which are revealed at the interview stage if you like from a dictionary which is pre-loaded and so on i don't want to be unkind about that because i think that was the right way of proceeding to start with but in order to achieve the kind of vision that rupert's talking about i think we're going to have to let the 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 candidates off the leash a bit we're still keeping a structure because we know that structured interviews is the way to have better prediction of, of subsequent job performance but we are being too uh, conservative about that the small c i think and, and just to uh, to build on what bernadette and, and richard have said I, I think that empower this is this is this should be empowering for candidates internal external um people who aren't in that team you know it, it, it should be a very empowering process and look i think competences were you know whether rigged is the right word, that they were um, people had got very adept at um, using them and it, and it favoured people who um, were good at doing that. Uh, and it was uh, blocking um, ways of recognising the full potential of people who um, uh, who had uh, great, uh, great expertise and great and, and great uh, stuff to offer. So as a candidate, if you if you see an ad um, and you say uh, and you believe that actually it should it, 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 the essential criteria were overspecified, or if you go through an interview process and you feel that that's not being done in the right way, you please do you know email or call me or uh, you know that's or the head of profession in your department uh and uh or your hr director or tell your staff network or whatever because that, that's that's how this will improve you know it will be where where someone well let me give it let me give an, uh, an accurate example an actual example so there was a job a policy job advertised um in uh, the cabinet office and uh it crossed lord agnew's desk and he made a really good point he said hang on a minute it says here 
um, if you're coming at level transfer, you uh, internally within the civil service, the pay is X. Uh, if you come in on promotion, it's percentage of X, standard practice. But why, if you come in from outside the civil service into that job, and it's got, um, and you meet all the criteria of the person that's doing it on level transfer, why would that be, why would you not be paid the same as a person on level transfer? It's a really sensible question. And it's, a, and it's what it actually comes down to is, level transfer was being used as a, you know, an uned, an uned, uneducated way of describing the capability that was required for the role. If that had been expressed in essential criteria based on experience and technical skill, it wouldn't have been, um, it, it would have been more open and, um, and it would have been uh, a, a better way of doing it in line with how we do success profiles. So that's what we went back with and it got changed. So that, that type of, the system needs to make those sorts of, um, those sorts of adjustments. Okay, thanks. Brilliant, thank you so much. I do realise we've sort of got five minutes left and, and people are, um, you know, ironically getting very warmed up now at this point in the webinar and loads and loads of comments are coming through. So no, no. Barney says, uh, Bernie, uh, absolutely right. Why demand written qualifications without seeking those with life skills and experience? Um, Sally Martin saying, excellent, listen to this, we'd love to be more involved. Lots of people asking if this webinar will be um, available again. Um, I wonder if you could just tie up your sort of um, final comments aligned to this, this question, which I like very much, um, which is about looking 10 years on post COVID, what change will we really sustain versus ingrained human desires of wanting to work physically together? Will it be an inclusive hybrid model? Everyone changes their work pattern or a divisive one. Some people return to go to work as normal. Others work mostly from home. And I think that touches on a lot of what but Bernadette, you said at the start about leading remotely, but is that going to be end up being divisive in some way in terms of who stays at home and, 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 and who works in the office? So final thoughts, maybe just to, to wrap up on that and, and anything else you, you would like to add, because we're pretty much coming up to the close. Um, Bernadette, would you? Oh, Rupert, go ahead. Bernadette, 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 oh, I'll, I'll Bernadette. Go. ladies first. <laughs> OK, yeah. well, my thoughts on this. So looking back, I like to look at the past and um, thinking about when I was on maternity leave and how would I, you know, not maternity leave, when I had really young kids and how I could never have imagined being able to work from home in this way. So I think a blended approach is what I see the future being. I think um, a hybrid way of working um, is the way that it should be. I mean, just looking at the survey that came out for my department, there were very few people who wanted to come into work every single day. Working from home two days a week was kind of the most popular uh, uh, um, uh, um, item that came out from there. So I think a blended um, uh, approach to working, really thinking about our beyond Whitehall agenda, but you know, we have more people in government outside of uh, Whitehall, but we are still connected using our uh, digital solution. We've really thought about, um, got, gotten better with the diversity of our workforce, uh, thinking about the most underrepresented group. So I think that the future is definitely hopeful, um, you know, looking at that, the past and looking at where we are now. Um, I don't think I could have dreamed being able to uh, uh, work from home. It's so easy to, to do my childcare right now in, in this space, but I do pop into work because I'm quite sedentary. So being able to have that blended approach and get the most out of our people is my uh, thoughts on the future. Thank you. Um, Rupert, final thoughts? Uh, so I um, I think it's a great way to look at it. What, what would we like our workplaces to be? Um, I agree with everything that Bernadette said. I mean, I, I have a vision that no one should have to move more than, no one should have to go more than a mile to where they work and they should be able to walk to it and so if you if you take that view i i have this vision in my mind whether it's going to take 10 or 20 years to get to where uh, we've got lots of hubs micro hubs where people go and sit down and mix with people from other departments and different grades and it's sort of agnostic um and uh you know op open plan but you know 
and and I think that when you think about how technology has allowed us to do even this was not possible 10 years ago because we didn't have the facilities and we didn't have the bandwidth and all those sorts of things in 10 years time we'll be doing this with virtual reality headsets and we'll all be in Dobbs's virtual conference center so so I think that that um but it will be hybrid okay you'll be the idea of of having a place of work and a desk is going to be um I think uh it's like, do you have a horse? I mean, yes, you might have a horse, but not for work. So yeah, I think it's quite, I think it's a uh, ex exciting, but we all, but we all need to like push the, the, that division. And people are productive in a hybrid, in a hybrid, in a hybrid environment. Richard, very quickly, I was sort of one okay. minute sort of over. So well, very I think on the, on the individual side, the employee side, if you like, I think the future's already here. We've just got to kind of sort it out. I think the idea that People are going to own their own skills, more professionalization, more acting like consultancies. I already work as a consultant. So, you know, working in people's homes, in coffee bars, in organizations, in hotels is what my world is like. And the virtual world is just another dimension of that. And on the organization side, I think organizations have got to sort out what it means to be a virtual organization rather than a smoke and glass office block. Uh, and that, you know, those, that, that's really exciting how that can be and I know that because so many people have said to me you know something I really enjoy this it's got its downsides but I like it I like the flexibility and I think that's here to stay okay brilliant Th thank, thank you all for that um everyone on the call we will be sending out a recording of this webinar because a lot of people are saying excellent points made can we re-watch so yes you, you can you can have a recording of the webinar i'm aware that we haven't got to a, a lot of the questions so i wonder if we theme them up and send them around to the panelists if you wouldn't mind sort of yeah, coming back really with some responses yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah that, that would be good because some of them are very kind of involved and, and getting into the, the meat yeah. of what you were saying um, and probably not long enough to deal with them here. So we'll, we'll do that as well. So it just remains for me to say thank you very much. Great discussion. Um, obviously a hot topic. I hope people have, have enjoyed it and got something from it. And um, yeah, have, have a great day, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye guys. I think that's all river. That's it. Okay. I look forward to the questions. Right. Yeah. Enjoy. Thank you for your time. Good team. Good team. See you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.